If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. We've had Casey Costello on The Crunch before. She's brilliant, plain speaking, and now she is a shiny new minister in the coalition government. She joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Casey. Good to have you. Thanks very much, Cam. Good to be here. I think this is the third time, isn't it, that we've spoken? Um, but now you're a minister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Things have changed a wee bit since the uh, campaign trail sort of narrative. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've got a hefty set of portfolios uh, are there. You know, you're the associate minister of immigration, the associate police minister, which I imagine uh, you've got some former colleagues that are sitting there raising their eyebrows a little bit about that. <laughs> Going from police association to associate minister. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of trip to the other side of the room. Yeah, yeah. Uh, customs, seniors, and health—it's a pretty hefty workload for a new minister. Yeah, it's um, still working through the delegations on the associate portfolio, so that'll um, yeah, there's still a bit of work to be done around that. But um, ministry for seniors and customs, sort of, and going into the busy time of year as well. So, yeah, I mean, I. I... Uh, I've known a couple of customs ministers over the years, and uh, one of the less savoury uh, jobs that they used to have to do, I don't know what it's still like today, and I guess you haven't found out yet, but part of it was uh, the ministers had to view imported videos or DVDs for classification um, if they needed to be done urgently. Uh, and there was all sorts of appalling things that would come through customs now, but I guess with streaming these days, it probably isn't isn't a, no. a big big workload no. around that. No, nothing like that's come across my desk, thank goodness. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you're in for a treat when you do, <laughs> when yeah. it does. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You, it's just uh, People aren't aware just of the sort of workload that a minister does. So just to start off today, just give us an idea of, uh, or give the listeners an idea of, what a workload of a minister who has five portfolios, whether they're associate minister or not. What sort of what that sort of work that entails? Uh, yeah, it, it's been a real because um, even though I work down here, you kind of you you don't sort of pick up kind of how much is involved. But the first part of it is getting up to speed, um, massive amounts of reading on the different portfolios, the key issues facing them, and then you've got to align that to the the um, commitments that you've made in terms of the coalition agreement, mm. the stuff, the work that we've got to get done and and what you need to do to make those things happen. Um, and that's, you know, particularly for something like the, the um, Minister for Seniors, that works across different portfolio in terms of other ministers that, that um, you know, provide those services, whether it's the Minister of Health or the Ministry of Social Development, there's other agencies that you've got to work with. So that's building those relationships. Um, but yeah, when when someone said to me, you know, I'll I'll try and get you, you know, because I've been on the other side of the table, I'll try and get you half an hour with the minister. It really is like that. Your calendar is literally um, you know, racing from um one meeting into the house, out of the house, you've got your, your house duty, your obligations to be in the house for periods of time. Um, yeah, so it's it's full on. And, and I think because there's so much for me to, to learn and mm. read and catch up on and, and know what's going on, that's kind of, um, yeah, very long days. And then because we've been in urgency um, each week as well. Even so longer. That, that, yeah, extends the days out a wee bit. So, yeah. Mm. You know, you get a lot of people don't understand uh, how the system works. You become the minister. Uh, technically, you're responsible for a whole lot of things, but the reality is, is that you have a whole bunch of officials that come to you with briefing documents, and it's really a, a sanitized version of all the work that they may have done. And then you're in the position where you have to make a decision, but you don't have all the information at hand. The information's yeah. in the hands of the ministers. And if you're like the last government, their ministers never questioned their officials, never said, well, hang on a second, how do you come to that th that thought process or what? how do you come to that conclusion? Are you prepared for that? 
And I think that's one of the, it's almost like an advantage because I'm so new to this mm. that I I don't even know what a dumb question is. I, I just, all I know is that I've come from, I mean, when when you sort of, your, your only real adult job was in the police and becoming a detective, mm. you just ask questions and you just keep asking questions. And if it doesn't make sense, you keep asking questions. And I suppose it's the, the luxury of knowing that, that, I, I literally know nothing, so therefore every question is justifiable to me, and and you just keep asking, um, and you can see it's it's this um, desire to know more and to mm. be informed as as best you can is is the biggest skill you can have in this role, is to just you know not not have a once over likely that every piece of paper you have to read it, you know, you have to know what's the content because you're putting your name to it, you're signing it off, you're saying mm. that you've acknowledged and accepted it. And if I don't agree or I don't know, you know, your your, your stack of two discuss pile gets bigger and bigger. But, you know, that's 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 why I'm here. That's, that's what I came in to do. So, yeah. yeah. There's all <laughs> sorts of things that little landmines out there, aren't there? I mean, you're in, you've just, you know, got your warrant as a minister. And then you're thrown in the deep end with this uh, smoking legislation and the vested interests that are wailing about tobacco control and all of those sorts of things. And I saw a, a news article. Uh, when was it? Hold on. I'll just bring it up. Uh, I saw a news article back on the 13th. So what are we, seven? That's a week ago about mm. snuff and s smokeless tobacco. And I saw that they quoted you saying, well, you know, I need some more information on this. And, of course, these health uh, people, the vested interests in, in keeping – I mean, this is the thing that really rips my undies with these so-called health people is that they've got so many vested interests in it, yet they accuse everybody else of vested interests. I mean, their entire being exists around trying to stop this or stop that, and their funding relies on it. Mm. But – you know, you, you said, you know, I think Sweden's one of the first countries in Europe to reach below the 5% threshold. That's a, a really important comment there that probably most readers of the Herald didn't understand yeah. because that 5% threshold is Ash's own metric for saying that a generation is smoke-free. Yeah. And But this is a thing. These health professionals that are in this industry are pushing this uh, narrative uh, that anything that contains nicotine is bad for you. I know from my own personal experience that that's just not true. It's not because I'm an advocate for smoking. I'm not. I, I despise cigarettes. I think they're horrible things. I think they're a pernicious, nasty, addictive product that has no merits as a product in any way, shape, or form, other than they're an inefficient way to deliver nicotine. Now, you might not know this, but nicotine is very, very important and a key product that helps people recover from strokes. No, I didn't. No, I didn't know that, yeah. Now, I know this because I've had a stroke, right, five yeah. years ago. I took up cigar smoking so I could get as much nicotine into my system as I could uh, in the shortest possible amount of time. Uh, because nicotine helps neuroplasticity, and a lot of strokes happen because of a lack of neuroplasticity. But the, these health people, they really annoy me because they're always saying, we need to ban this because it's got nicotine in it, you know, and that's why they're talking about snooze and, and chewable tobaccos and things like that because it got nicotine. And, and the thing that I found amazing was Professor Chris Bullen said, um, and he says he specialises in tobacco control, right? He's not convinced more smoking alternatives were needed in New Zealand. Really? Like, seriously? Is is this guy on the same planet as us? This is the, um, and I think it was an unfortunate situation where the media got out in front of this story before mm. we did. Yeah. Um, because the, the the narrative got that ran away was that, you know, we're going to repeal the smoke-free legislation, and that was never what was discussed or proposed. Um, there was components of it mm. that were um, just, and, and as I said in previous interviews, that it was just bad legislation. It was it was um, 
not not going to deliver the outcome we were trying to achieve, and therefore it was, you know, it was a, an opportune time to step back and go. Our objectives are the same. We still want to achieve those targets. We still want to reduce the harm that mm. you know the health harm that's occurring we just I think there's a different way of going about it and yeah. and I think it's and, and even at the time when the bill was debated when the legislation was first debated um you know even even the green party were arguing against this concept of prohibition as being a solution you know we we just and it was a pseudo prohibition that there's no way around it it was a pseudo prohibition that they were putting in place and making the retailers have to be the policing of it you know they were going to be at the front end of you know we were going to reach a stage where you could be a 35 year old man with four children but because you were born after 2009 you couldn't buy tobacco but um you know your mate who was born you know six months before you could and that was the reality of what we we're going to deliver mm. so and, and at this stage that's what we're trying to do is look at all of it and exactly as you say look at products and get advice and and come up with something that that is workable and the latest um health survey results had us down at 6.8 percent um yeah. smoking so so we're tracking down faster than they had projected without any of these um initiatives being Im implemented um so the the cost and the burden on retailers to to put this in place um you know it was timely that we stepped back and had a look at it yeah, I mean, that's the thing the media, I think, have let the public down uh, by never questioning anything that, that Labor implemented. I mean, you're talking about the age restriction there where anybody born after a certain day would never be able to, to buy a tobacco product. Mm. Um, you know, as you say, a pseudo ban that was arbitrary. It came up out of the minister's mind where that line was going to be drawn. They could have drawn it anywhere, but they chose to draw it there. The other thing that they had was, you know, this talk about, oh, there's going to be 8,000 extra Kiwis killed um, because they're going, we're going to um, remove their low tobacco uh, or their low nicotine tobacco regulation. And again, this was a pseudo ban on cigarettes. The, mm. the New Zealand market is so small. By having that in effect, they were saying, well, if you don't get your nicotine levels down, in your tobacco, which is a little hard as you grow it, you know, and it's got nicotine mm. in it naturally. I mean, e even tomatoes have nicotine in them. But they were effectively putting in place a ban without having a ban because they didn't have the courage to say they were going to ban cigarettes as of this date, boom. Yeah. And, they, and they didn't do it. So they were pretending to care. But the reality was is that if you're addicted to nicotine, you're going to try and get that hit no matter what. So if we've got uh, cigarettes with lower nicotine tobacco, guess what you're going to do? You're going to smoke more cigarettes, even though it's lower nicotine levels. And they just can't see these things. I mean, the age restriction one, that cohort of of uh, of people is already under 5% without having any ban, which is Ash's own designation of what a smoke-free generation is. Yeah. But and, nobody and explains that to the public. And so you're yeah. demonized and made out to be this evil group of people that are going to kill 8,000 people. I mean, we, we never can believe those numbers after the pandemic anyway. Yeah. And and that was a, another one of the, the modeling pathways. But I, I think that at the end of the day, the, the, the work's underway um, and in and, and time when we come out with some solutions that the, the – yeah, you know, I, I hope there's a fair audience in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. Because the objective, you know, we've we've got the same goal. And and I think also in a society you've got to balance up the number of things that are causing harm and and placing communities at risk. Um, there's a whole range of them. And this is getting some balance around the the yeah. level of harm and risk this is causing when you look at you know the the epidemic of methamphetamine, and mm. you've got the alcohol harm, and you've there's a whole you know just um, violent crime, all of those sort of things. It's it's kind of um, it was a it was a story that kind of grew legs in the absence of you know anything else happening at the time. But I think things have quietened down, and people are getting a bit more rational about what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, I don't think these people be rational though. I mean, you've got. Professor Chris Bullen saying 
chewing tobacco is likely to be a lot less harmful than smoking tobacco, but it's not completely safe. I mean, that's just a ridiculous statement right from the get-go. Um, for a start, we know that chewing tobacco is a lot less harmful than smoking tobacco. It's the combustion of tobacco that puts all of the chemicals yeah. and everything into you. But to say it's not completely safe, if that's the guideline that they're operating to, then you have to question, well, okay, if we don't want to have things that are not completely safe in the marketplace, <laughs> yeah. then hello, let's have a look at vaccines, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for a start. I mean, this is the stupidity, but look, I think you you may be expecting more from these people than they're willing to give because their position is uh, one of prohibition, effectively. They, no nicotine is good nicotine in their world without even thinking about the people like me who it's benefited hugely. Uh, and and, and then, I, think, I think what we've got to go back to is that the nature of, um, you know, as, as you've said, that the people elect parliament, we have a government now, Oh, and and at the end of the day, it's it's our role, which is you know we've been completely transparent. It's our role to deliver on what our coalition agreement is committed to. And um, I think it's just making sure who's actually driving the ship is the people that voted, as opposed to the bureaucrats. Um, and you know that the the proof's in the pudding. I think as we move forward. Yeah, I mean it's just astonishing though the contortions that they'll go through to stop. Uh, you know, absolutely everything um, that, it, that's that got nicotine in it. And I mean, you see their irrational responses to vaping, for instance, uh, which is, you know, 98% be more beneficial, well, not beneficial, but less harmful uh, than cigarette smoking. But, oh, no, because it's got nicotine in it, um, well, that's bad. We need to stop that. And there's this moral outrage about vaping and kids vaping and all of this sort of stuff. Well, you know, kids are going to do what kids do. If you make it illegal, they'll find a way. And if they're going to vape, they're going to vape. But not all of them are going to do it. Yeah. But it's and, better and that they vape than, than, than smoke cigarettes. It just is. Yeah. And and that's the the the, the logic that and I the concern I had about when you when something's prohibited you make it more attractive, not less. And smoking has has generally become less and less attractive to younger people. It's it's just not the it's not the go to position. So that was happening naturally. And I, my concern is, as soon as you say it's prohibited, you can't do it, then it suddenly has a elevated attractiveness. So yeah, so I think I think we we're on the right path. We've got the good discussions going, and we've got um and there's a whole range of advice that we're working through to make sure we've got all the information we need to make some really good decisions moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I mean a big, uh, big portfolio. It is. And you know, that's not helped by people like Janet Hoke, who are saying things that while these products have contributed to reduce smoking rates overseas, New Zealand experts on tobacco control are skeptical about whether they would be successful here. But they mm. present no evidence to back that up. And and the and the reporter in the article uh, didn't say, and why is that? <laughs> you know, and so I'm hoping that you as a minister is going to ask those questions. Why is that? What's your evidence? Yeah. Show us your working, right? Yeah. And and that's that's what I see our role is. I mean, the, the ministerial role is is a lot more important than you know, I think people realise is it's that because you have the authority to ask those questions and demand the information and get the, the, the facts to you um and keep digging until you get to the point that you are, are satisfied that you've got all the mm. information. And I think that's why broad engagement is so important. Um um, getting and that's you know you know real objective of mine is to make sure that I'm getting out and about that I'm not reliant on um, what's in the office that you actually get out mm. and and maintain those connections to the broader community because um, yeah I, I get I get the sense that you could become very locked in here because of you know the hours and you you've really got to make that effort to continue to be out and about yeah and consult widely but I guess your yeah. training as a detective is in, you know, you had so long in that role that it's ingrained, it's a habit to, for you to ask questions all the time until you get. And, and, I th and it's similar to, to what, you know, what, you know, interviewers like yourself and, mm. you know, 
when you talk to people a lot, you get to understand, you know, who's telling you the truth, who's who's evading you, who's, you know, that's a credible person, that's not a credible person, all of those sort of things. It's just that it's almost a, a visceral sort of reaction you have when you're talking to people about, yeah, this is a person that I can, you know, I'm confident in. And I, I think that kind of puts you in good stead. I think the more you've engaged with people and worked with people across all societies, um, and and that's I, I think the advantage. And you know, so when you've worked with a right wide range of people, and you kind of get to understand how to make people come together and and work well together, and all those sort of things. So those are the sort of skills that I think you know when I kind of weighed up that I don't have the political expertise but you kind of look at the other stuff you bring to the table and, um, I, you know, and I, I know how to work hard. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Your role as Associate Police Minister, what, what areas of responsibility do you have with, with that role? So we're still working through the delegations um, mm. the, and that's kind of, it, it's hard because, you know, you've got new ministers in all the roles still trying to get their head around their own portfolios and how delegations would work. Mm. So with each of the um, ministers, you know, we've sort of sat down and worked through, A, what we're, what we're trying to achieve through the coalition, the commitments that we've made, um, and how does those delegations can be allocated based upon what New Zealand First Coalition Agreement says and how I can um, progress those in each of those areas. So um, still a lot of process to work through around how those delegations would work. And they need to be in a way that it makes sense that, you know, mm. you've got something you can be directly responsible for and you're not kind of given something that you're partially responsible for, otherwise it gets really messy. So, yeah, we'll, we'll work through the process and um, hopefully in the new year we'll kind of finalise all of that stuff and we can make announcements. Yeah, I'm looking forward to to seeing that. My, my particular area of interest with regards to police is how they're going to handle the devolution of the Firearm Safety Authority out of the police into the new areas. You know, I, I, I hope that is uh, hastened along quickly. Um, well, Nicole McKee yeah. has that um, specific yeah. responsibility. Um, you know, great, great person, just fantastic, yeah. and and a real, um, and and just the expertise, but also her her capacity to kind of work with people. She's, you know, I really respect her. Her and Karen Shaw, I think, have got you know big responsibilities, but they're definitely the right people for the job. I've been really impressed. Yeah, I mean, I've always been impressed by Nicole, and she's got a, a hard job to deal with that, you know, it, because I've watched over the last four years the police lobby, uh, and I know that they've lobbied uh, MPs or politicians because they all spout the same thing. They're saying, oh, no, the police tell us that we need to do this because of this. Mm. But that's the problem that, I, that I've seen with politicians is they listen to the police when it comes to things like firearms, when the police are actually amongst the worst firearms users in the nation, <laughs> you know, and they're cooking the books in terms of statistics. I mean, you know, the, one of the things that, that you know, as a member of Antique Arms, we see this all the time. We always get called up by the police to come and advise them on certain things to do with firearms because they don't have the skill set to do it. And yet, on the other hand, they're lobbying the minister saying we need to have a register because um, of this massive problem with straw briars. And no one ever says, well, what? how how big is this problem with straw mm. buyers, right? And, and you will have heard this. You would have heard this over yeah. the time, straw buyers. But they, they only ever come up with one example of a guy that they caught before we had a register. So So it's not even, like, even relevant. But that's the sort of level that the police have been pushing uh, as in their hostility towards firearms owners, uh, and they almost have a have a behaviour that we're guilty until proven innocent. What we're actually just mass murderers that are going to commit a crime at some point, and we're going to catch you before you do that. Because that's how my interact. I mean, I used to be a G man. I used to stand and support the police in everything they do until I became a collector. And then it just became every interaction that I had with the police was a negative one when it could, should have been a positive one. 
there is a bit of a culture out there amongst the police. And I know you used to be a police officer, but it's changed. It seriously has. And and it changed after, obviously, after after Christchurch. But there's, and, two, I, there's 250,000 people like me who are no longer G-men. I, I think that's the challenge too, is that it's the, the machine of policing, mm. which is the, the, the entire bureaucracy and, and not to lose sight that within that big machine, it's it's a similar thing, you know, when you when you talk about the health system and when you talk collectively about the organization, there's real disappointment. But individuals within those organizations are outstanding. Absolutely. And and and, and that's that's what I think is is the the as we move forward. Uh, and and I wonder how much of it is and you know that and that's what I hope to to discover is that whole um you know the bureaucracy that that's kind of eaten up frontline operational organizations mm. and how much um is needing to be done to give the frontline people who do the job do it well and know how to do it and know how to deal with things um and and give them the authority and autonomy to to get on and do their jobs and pull some of this other stuff away because that's that's what I I recognise is that you know the, I've still got really good friends and colleagues that mm. are in the job doing fantastically who are weighed down by a bureaucracy and it's the same in the health system it's the same in education you've got great people that are almost despite the organisation that they're part of still able to do good things and that's that's kind of where I I want to see that focus shift back to allow those people. Um, you know, I, I used to use the anecdote that, you know, you've got more people wandering around with clipboards um, <laughs> telling you how to do your job than you've got actually doing it. You know, mm. yeah, the reality is that, you know, you look at our rural police stations that you, were the backbone of New Zealand. They were the guy that you yeah. went to and knew everything going on in their towns. They did. And we and we started shutting those stations down. We lost 24-7 presence. We, you know, all of those sort of things that... Um, for what purpose, and and that's the stuff that I I kind of want to recognise that there's just really great people doing great stuff individually, and how does the organisation support them to excel rather than weigh them down? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, and, I know. And I think that's our job. Yeah, I know, I kind of know that through my own family. I mean, obviously, my cousin Greg was a a, mm. a, a, a sole charge a police officer in, in Waiuku. He had to rely on himself. Um, yeah. Back then, that's all sort of gone now. But um, yeah. you know, in terms of the bureaucracy, Wayne, I know exactly what you're talking about, and, and I think it's pleasing from my perspective, at least, to see the ultimate poacher turn gamekeeper in you, in yourself and Mitch, both being act, having active roles in the police on the front line, knowing exactly what's going on. And I don't think it's ever happened before in in the history of police ministers or associate police ministers where you've got ex-coppers uh, who are on the front line in these roles now who can actually say to the commissioner, well, hang on a second, now, let's think about the front line here. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's a, a refreshing change. And uh, I think we're already seeing the benefits of that. I mean, there was a gang funeral last weekend uh, in Wakatani, 15 arrests made. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that would have happened under the previous government. I think they would have, you know, given them hugs and 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 a police escort through the town. And I and I think that's the real shift that there's this um there's um a real sense of just a changing mood, you know, that 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 you know, we're about getting things moving, getting things going and yeah. and and having that accountability. Because I mean the public service are um, you know they they are required to deliver what the government of the day wants to do, and that's that's in mood, that's in you know ethos, that's in you know that that's they're required to reflect what the government of the day wants to see, and I think that's what we've got now is a real change of mood, and and I have to say you know really hand on heart the the relationships within you know within the parties and the and the government coalition is. Really positive. Mm, I was going to um, ask you, you know, about that. Um, you know, you mentioned Nicole McKee and, and Karen Chaw. 
Is there a collegiality between the different caucuses, particularly with ACT in New Zealand First and, and even across yeah. international? The, you may be in different parties, but you're all part of the same team now. And yeah. there's this working together to get things done, check them off, make sure we're delivering promises, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really, you know, and I sincerely say that that's exactly the, and, and even with, um, you know, the backbench MPs, the, mm. the, you know, that, that encouragement and endorsement, you know, you, you kind of go through this sense of, you know, sort of wandering around a little bit kind of like a deer caught in the headlights, um, really positive interactions, really, you know, and, and encouraging, you know, down to, you know, there was um, three more maiden statements last night from National, mm. you know, great speeches, great interaction. And then afterwards, just that, you know, that sense of understanding each other that little bit more. Um, mm. It's it's really good. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, um, I'm finding it and, and really smart people, like really, you know, smart, um, dedicated people committed to their, particularly the electorate MPs, you know, the mm. ones that are um, advocating yeah. for their communities. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed. Have you reached across the aisle and had a chat with Greg? Yeah, yep, we had a catch up. Um, we it, it was um, it was when Greg first told me that he was you know entering politics and mm. told me that he was going to stand with Labour. We sort of had, had a bit of a catch up, and we've we've <laughs> caught up every now and then. But yeah, he um, I I had to do, do a bit of a tip of the hat to him for in my maiden statement, and um, so yeah, you know, I. And, and Greg's he's got a great heart. He's you know, he's always had that. Um and he's you know, he's the consummate electorate MP. You know, he's he's that guy that everyone will, you know, know who he is and, and connect with him. So yeah. I, That's I, the thing I, is that politicians get labeled, they get, you know, branded, uh, and people don't have the time or the inclination to actually truly understand where someone's coming from. And that includes, you know, uh, across the political spectrum. And, and, you know, what you said about Greg there, um, being compassionate, that's what I, that's how I've found Greg. Um, mm. You know, I've always, he's always been approachable, um, even when I was just a, a lowly blogger. And that was when he was in the police association. I've had a couple of cup, you know, cups of coffee with him in a chat just to keep lines of communication open. You know, a year after I had my stroke, the guy sent me the most lovely texts, you know, completely out of the blue that showed he he has a true compassion yeah. there that people don't often see because they're in public dealing with difficult subjects. And when you're the police association or essentially the union boss um, <coughs> for police officers, you're out there fighting for better paying conditions and you can appear to be hard bitten and all that. And people miss that truly human connection that people have yeah. uh, and that compassion. And, and you know, I was uh, really pleased to see Greg um, actually beat Nicola Willis. Um, in fact, I texted him to congratulate him. And I'm especially pleased to see that he's an assistant speaker mm -hmm. um, because I think that he will bring that compassion to the job uh, that I've seen uh, that many people yeah. don't see about politicians. Yeah, and and I think one of the things that I, I I always admired with Greg within the police association it was one of those early lessons in the in that political environment was that ability to kind of get people who may not be agreeing to sit around and just have a beer and have a chat and clear the air and like at least know, how, listen. how we yeah at least listen to each other and um and he's always been good at that so yeah I mean. He is one of the Labour MPs whom I respect. I mean, it's very few MPs that I respect, to be fair. I've just known so many of them, and many of them are beneath contempt. Those who gain my respect, they're uh, people that uh, they've shown me a side to them that's not shown in public, usually. Yeah. And, um, and I, the, the media, I think, are part of the problem with that. They don't do interviews like this where we're just having a chat. They they yeah. tend to be combative, or they ring you up with specific questions and get specific answers, and then we never actually find out the true person that we're talking about or talking to. Yeah, and it's a, 
it's that soundbite journalism where it's it's about the the clip or the the soundbite, and I'm, I suppose you have some sympathy with the fact that you know most um, most public you know have a very short attention span and they just want to you know absorb a, a quick headline and and move on. I hope that there's more of that, and I, I think that's telling. You know, in terms of you know your platform and 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 um, how how you're working with. Um, that long form interview and mm-hmm. how you're being more in depth, getting to know people, and and the fact that that's connecting with an audience and it's growing, I think it tells that there are there are more and more New Zealanders who have got tired of that click type media. Yeah, combative clickbait, um, yeah. gotcha, gotcha type journalist that we journalism that we see <laughs> all too often on News Hub. Uh, you know where they're trying to take people down. Um, you know, and I used to be part of that too, so I understand it. I mean, you know, mm. I used to, I used to go through, uh, you know, when I was blogging, I would be always trying to get somebody. And when you get into that mentality of always trying to get somebody, very negative things start happening to you uh, mm. because you're not actually looking to build people up or to empower people or to uh, facilitate, even. Or just listen. You just want to get people, and yeah. you, it's just it's you know, you know it's a, a little bit like the police. I guess they're always looking for criminals. So everything they see, they they're treating it from a perspective as this is the potential criminal. Even if they walk up beside you and say, "How about this weather?" Eh? You know, people mm. go, mm, "Okay, what do you want?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, because we we conditioned them uh, to it. I agree, and, and, and to some extent, though, you kind of there is that balance where you, you know, you do need to drive an accountability. You know, we're we're elected to represent, and that should be recognised that we are accountable. Um, we're accountable for you know we're, we're we're the ultimate public servant. You know, we are completely here at the discretion of the people that voted us to be here, and therefore we should be completely accountable to. But those questions need to be intelligent. You know, they need to be mm. informed and and relevant. And you know, when you get several journalists will will interview the prime minister and ask virtually the same question over and over again, mm. you kind of start to think, well, you know, is this journalism or is this just I, I want to be able to use this quote that someone else has got? I just think there's there's really important questions to be asked, and mm. then we should be accountable to answering those questions. But sometimes it's it's a bit more than just a you know repeating what what the headline of yesterday's news said and asking the same question. I just yeah. yeah I think. Well, let's touch on accountability because New Zealand First is often derided, criticised, mocked from both sides of the spectrum for never delivering promises. If you're a political tragic like myself, you can, you know, people say to me, oh, what has Winston Peters ever done for New Zealand? Right. And and I can reel off a few things that they've done because I'm interested in that. There's a perception yeah. in the general public that Winston and New Zealand First never deliver their promises. Is that in the forefront of the New Zealand new New Zealand First caucus that, hey, we're actually going to put a stake in the ground. We're going to say we're going to deliver these things and now we are going to deliver them. Yes, very much so, because and that's what I think the strength of the coalition agreements are. Is there's there's you know there's a list. You know, mm. there, there you go. There's our list. It's um, great for people like me. Right? Yeah, I've got that list there. I can start ticking them off. <laughs> ticking you know? them off. Yeah. Um, so there's that part of it, but there's also the part that I think, and that's what you know I, I said in my maiden statement that um, you know Winston is the consummate statesman. You know he mm. he. He knows how to work this and make things happen. But a big part of doing that is that you're not always the one that gets the credit for it. Mm. You know, it's 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 that puppet master kind of environment where I put them in the room with them and I get them to talk to each other about this and then something will happen. Mm. And 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 it doesn't, you know, that was that Ronald Reagan statement, you know, it's amazing what you can get done when you don't care who gets the credit for it. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's like that, and I think it's now that the change really is, is making sure that it's very clear 
that um, we were responsible for this and, you know, we achieved this and we delivered this and, and make sure that we take ownership rather than, you know, it's been done, um, making sure that it's been done and this is what we did to make it happen um, mm. and, and actually claim that credit and be very clear about that um, because it's, you know, it's like the 1800 police that, you know, um, you know, New Zealand first pushed and drove, strove for to to get with the coalition with Labour and got it delivered, and then you know, um, it was never the seen only thing that New was Zealand delivered. <laughs> it's the yeah. only, it was the only so thing. The only delivered. <laughs> and and so, Labour even tried to to make that difficult. Yeah, and and that so those are the things I think is the shift is that a- acknowledging that this is politics and you know it's it, it's. You know, you you want to know where you you want to know where your destination is, but sometimes you've got to take um, a few side roads to get there. Um, we just, you know, um, the skill is is knowing which detours to take in short to ensure you get to the right place in the end, and make sure that you know everyone knows that we were the one that got you there. So, and that's where I think um, the strength is now is is having that skill and knowledge that that um Winston and Shane bring to the agreement uh, to the situation and then the workhorses that are gonna kind of keep pushing um shoulder to the grindstone all the way through. So yeah, I mean this is the great thing about that coalition <laughs> agreements. The first time we've ever seen such a thing, a comprehensive documents that you know literally we can check off. There's two areas that listeners of of reality check radio are particularly exercised about. And I see yesterday, uh, you know, um, when was it? Tuesday. Tuesday, um, it was announced that the rollback of the Therapeutic Products Act um, is underway. That That's a, a key one that, that a lot of people in the freedom community have been really pushing on. Mm-hmm. What's the time frame for hearing about the COVID inquiry or the expansion of the existing COVID inquiry to include, you know, a whole lot of other things? And what is there some work streams that are going on to to get that happening as quickly as possible? Yeah, there's definitely um so that that's a a, a big program of work and, and mm. it's about and I think the the caution is making sure that we're controlling the narrative that it doesn't kind of run away and and get you know as you saw with the smoke free the, the mm. media pick up a story so that's why i think it we the work's um definitely underway but we we want to make sure that that this isn't run by the media it's run by the, the government, government. Has, has got yeah. control of it and so therefore you know we'll, we'll we'll work through that process and be very considered about how we um take this to the public so that um it doesn't get you know distracted and um because the, the greatest risk is, you know, we, we clearly have a a, a, um, a confirmed objective. It's clearly stated what we're trying to achieve, um, and there's a a commitment from the coalition collectively to do it. And and we just want to be smart and intelligent about it. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the work's definitely underway. But the hundred day plan was a real focus on, st- you know making sure that we can start growing and mm. be industrious again. So that was yeah. um because yeah the, the financial situation is really dire. Mm. So we that had to be the focus really because there was going to be no money to do anything else if we didn't kind of start getting the wheels moving again. So Yeah, it always reminds <laughs> me of Morris Williamson's favorite quote that everyone wants to go to heaven but no one wants to die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, um, that's, yeah, I mean, that's that's pleasing to hear. For the listeners, will be pleased to hear that there is work underway on the on the COVID inquiry. Um, but you know, I've been watching politics. I mean, it's hard to think exactly when I started, but you know, I'm 55 now, so you know, let's call it 40 years, 15 years old, maybe probably earlier than that. Let's call it 45 years. I've been involved in politics, and and of course, a good chunk of that is under the MMP environment been involved in politics deeply uh, in all of the MMP years. I can't recall a coalition where everyone seems to be on the same page, where the, I mean, I, I, I remember the, the first MMP coalition, New Zealand First and, and National. Yeah. There was white anting going on <laughs> from inside National. Um, there was 
ankle tapping. There was all sorts of stuff. And we saw that even though there was a coalition on the surface, that underneath that surface, that there were two teams that were struggling with each other. Um, yeah. I've seen that uh, too with um, you know Helen Clark's government, that she was always struggling with factions within her own party, let alone the disparate factions that, that joined in with that. John Key had similar problems, you know, a much different Maori party back then. Yeah. You know, they actually had integrity and mana uh, that was earned, not demanded, um, <coughs> but it was still fractious. Um, what I'm seeing now is something different. It's something I've never seen before in all the years I've been involved, involved in politics where, yes, there's three teams in the coalition, but it seems you're all signed up to singing from the same song sheet and praising each other across parties when jobs are, are well done. You know, if Chris Bishop does something well, there'll be a New Zealand mm -hmm. first associate minister that might say, well, that was fantastic. You know, well done, Chris. Da, da, da. There seems a cohesion there that I've never seen before in New Zealand politics. And, and this may actually be the nirvana of MMP where it is a true majority that represents the majority of New Zealanders based on the vote, and you're actually embodying that in the in your actions. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've sat and reflected on it. I thought, I have not seen this before, and I'm liking this. Yeah, and I wonder how much of it is when, you know, you know when, when you've got a common enemy, it's amazing how well people can work together, you know. If, if, and I think that we've got a really clear demon to slay, you know, like there's this real the media sense of, <laughs> <laughs> but but across the board, you know, we know yes. that we're in you know pretty dire situation across mm. the board in a lot of areas. So when when you've got a really clear objective, which is what the coalition agreement has has given us. You're not so distracted by the, the the noise on the peripheries. You've got a really clear objective, and that's what I see is that you know every day we're kind of looking at um, what's next on the list. You know how how can we make this happen? Nationals, you know, got some important legislation um, acts, got their um, the ninety day trial mm. legislation. So we're all really supportive of that. So when you've got that common objective, it's I think it makes it easier to to keep focused and not be distracted by the white noise on the periphery so yeah you mentioned before <laughs> about the public service and the expectation that they do what the government wants yet we've seen the public service lobbying against things that a democratically elected government has decided in a coalition agreement is what they're going to implement because that's what the voters elected us to do and you've got these guys coming out opposing everything you know, you've got a clear directive from the government to roll back the 90-day day, um, legislation or expand it. No, it's not really rolling yeah. back, but rolling back some aspects of it that were ridiculous, fair pay agreements and those sorts of things. And you've got the, the PSA coming out opposing that. You've got Treasury officials who are saying, oh, no, we actually think you should keep the fair pay agreements in place. They're colouring it by saying it's advice. But, of course, the media says... Treasury says keep fair pay agreements in place, and the Im implication is that the media agree with keeping fair um, payment agreements in place, as as do these officials, even though they gave three options. And so, you know, I think when you talk about the common enemy, I think the com common em enemy out there is the vested interests in media, in in unions, and the public service association to keep the status quo at the very least and fight absolutely everything that this government does. I mean, we've seen a full-on attack, uh, and Winston Peters is, has copped most of it. You know, they, they accuse him of an unfair attack on the media. But everyone I know says, yeah, go, Winston, keep going. You know, do more yeah. to, to hurt them. Yeah, You're over the target. You're copping flack, you know, so you're over the target. I really think that common enemy actually is the mainstream media because they're out to get you. And and that's the part that I think is why it's so important for us all individually as, as MPs and, and ministers 
to ensure we retain that close direct connection to the public, to our communities. Because as you know, you know, what you hear in this um, okay. in this bunker <laughs> is is very different to what, what is actually engaging. And and in all of us that have, you know, big families and lots of people that are doing it really hard. That's the that's the resolve you need. That's the vindication you need. It's it's not not whether you've got a, a favourable headline in the newspaper. It's about you know actually delivering those outcomes and and making sure that the people that voted you to get here um, are getting what we promised. And um, and you know we die in the ditch on making sure that that's that's what we deliver. So yeah, I mean that. A lot of politicians forget that. You know, I can remember my mother haranguing politicians around our dining room table um, when they were being arrogant or uh, overbearing. It was my mother that was um, telling them off you know, or point, pointing the finger at them and saying, you know, in the next election, you're going to lose your seat. And they'd be you know, scoffing and laughing and everything. But you know what? My mother was always 100% right. She, she, yeah. she, she knew stuff. Uh, that they could only ever contemplate uh, yeah. and never truly know. And and she she was the, perhaps the person that taught me the most about politics. You know, she taught me that you know when the ministerial when the ministers arrive that there's actually other important people that you need to look after, and that's the drivers and and the staff yeah. and and those. So she would always go out out onto Mountain Road, knock on the windows of all the Crown limousines tell them all to come inside and they'd be all downstairs playing pool and uh, drinking coffee and eating scones that mum had made them and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. And and that's where I learned a lot about what goes on inside politics because I'd be down there playing pool with those guys rather than up listening yeah. to the blowhards who are politicians. Because when you talk to those guys, you find out what's actually happening. Yeah. And it's, I, I mean, every every company I've ever you know run or been involved with, if you want to know what's going on, you talk to the security guards, you talk to the cleaners, you know, th- those are the people that know who's there late, who's there first, who's working hardest, you know, those are the people that kind yeah. of appreciate, um, you know, being listened to and, and can tell you what, what the truth of the situation is. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's, that's, it's, you know, we, you know, it doesn't matter what your role is, you know, I'm, I'm a public servant. I'm I'm here to serve. This is, uh, you know, this is, you know, I I was elected to do something and to deliver something, and um, and that's my job, and I'm accountable to those people that put me here. So, yeah, it, and it seems that the public service has lost sight of that. That's their role to serve. I facetiously wrote the other day that I, you know, what I'd love to see is the government appoint Stephen Joyce as the new public service commissioner and um, imagine the carnage, the wailing and the, scre- <laughs> the screaming. But, uh, you know, they announced um, Bill English to do a review of Kainga Ora and the squealing that came from that was huge. I could hear it, you know, deafening me from Wellington here in Auckland. But, you know, I, I think that would be a delicious thing to do is put Stephen Joyce in, as the public service. I mean, there can be no... Uh, misunderstanding here. The public service no longer serves the public. They're serving themselves. They are hostile to, you know, they've become political. Well, if that's the case, then we need to head down the path of what happens in the United States after election when, when a government changes hands. The bosses of the various departments change hands as well because they need trusted people in there to implement what the government wants. And I think we're at that point now in New Zealand. I think there can be no uh, mistaking that the public service has become political and therefore we need political solutions to solve it. I, I would say, though, that and I think there, there's a real strong caution in there. And, and you, I mean, I know you're, you're just generalising, but I think we can't lose sight of the fact that within all of these bureaucracies, there's great people. Of course, and it's just it's just about making sure the ones that have the good ideas and that that they are recognised and given license to do what they know and and what they can contribute to the solutions because um and that's the the that's why you know 
being there, you know, knowing who the cleaners are, knowing who the drivers are, knowing, you know, they, they, that's how you tell where the answers that, you know, um, in, in any organisation, it doesn't have to be a, a government agency, but I think that's the part is, is getting in there and, and wading through the, so that you're not just talking to the top echelon, that you're talking to the people that are doing the job and making sure you're getting the right information. Now, I've got two more questions for you. And they're the questions I'm going to ask my buddies at the end of the show. What do you think in the last year for you, uh, this is this is your choice here, what was the best thing about last year? And it can be personal, can be political, could be business-related, can be anything. I just want to hear what you think is the best thing that happened in, to you or, or to New Zealand in the last year. And the second question to follow on from that is, what are you hoping for in the next year to come? I, you know, and I know it sounds trite, but the best thing was to to get here. Mm. Like I never for an instant thought that I would. I really, I, I got involved in this because I wanted to make sure that New Zealand first got here. You know, that mm. that was that was my objective to to get New Zealand first here and to be in the position I am I am in is. Um, you know, it's it's unequal. You know, it, it just I feel so privileged, and it it just I don't even know how to say it without sounding trite. You know, this is this is genuinely an opportunity to to really make a difference, mm. and I never thought I'd get. You know, I I lobbied for so long, and I've I've advocated and fought for so long to actually be here and be in a position where I could actually make the differences I've been fighting for is just incredible. Mm. And for what I want to achieve next year is to be able to look at that coalition agreement and say, I did this, 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 and this, you know, I want to actually say there's something that even if I don't get the credit for it, I know that I made some stuff happen. And um, that's my ultimate goal is to be able to sit there. I'm a list person. So I love making lists. So that's, that's a great <laughs> list, but um, but yeah, that to be able to sit down, um, and I don't care if my name's not to it, if I know that I help make some stuff happen, real stuff that affects people's lives, then um, yeah, I'll 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 go away from here incredibly happy. Oh, well, that sounds like an admirable goal <clears throat> to uh, to make those things happen, and it, it'll be a refreshing change after six years of inaction and going backwards for us to actually start achieving things and moving forwards again. Yeah. Well, you'll, I, I no doubt you'll hold me to account if I don't make it happen. <laughs> well, other media might not, but I certainly will. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure having you on the crunch this year, Casey, and hopefully we'll have you on, on the crunch again next year. Uh, so we can and, uh, check in on those things and those achievements. Yeah. And have a fantastic Christmas game. I hope, um, hope you had a good break and, um, talk to you in the new year. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you and your family and um, tell your brother he needs to come to lunch again in the new year. Okay, I'll let him know. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot. Cam. Okay. Okay, bye. Thanks, bye. I really love chatting with Casey. She's got important portfolios, but I'm sure she is going to be up to the task. We'll check in with Casey again next year, but for now, she and her colleagues are off to a ripper of a start for the new government. Tell me your thoughts on what Casey had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.